Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, the connection between BDS, Hamas, Christian Palestinianism, and replacement theology. We'll also expose the replacement theology of teachers like Pastor John Piper. It's very dangerous what he's teaching. Some might even say anti-Semitic. You decide. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brandon brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brandon House. Good evening and welcome to the Worldview Weekend Hour. Tonight, the connection between Hamas, BDS, Christian Palestinianism, and replacement theology. I'm more excited about tonight's program than I have been about a program in a long time, Uh, maybe in part because I've learned an awful lot in my research for this week's broadcast. We haven't so far gone to a lot of scripture in this series on Hamas, but tonight we certainly will. We'll also look at the, I believe, dangerous teaching, both from a national security standpoint and theologically, the dangerous teaching of men like Pastor John Piper. He has uh, promoted many things we have disagreed with along the way, including social justice, uh, the ideologies of Martin Luther King Jr., who himself described himself really uh, as a democratic socialist. Uh, He has declared that Christians should not own guns. I deal with that in great detail in the sixth and final hour of Sabotage the Movie. Sabotagethemovie.com is the website to watch the first hour for free. Sabotagethemovie.com. So we've talked a lot about John Piper. I uh, deal with John Piper a lot also in my book, Marxianity, because he is part of the neo-Calvinist movement and the Gospel Coalition. And you'll find that at marxianity.com. Well, tonight we'll be covering some new material we've never covered in relation to John Piper on television. We've touched on some of this on radio, but not to the detail we will tonight for television. So I hope you have a Bible nearby and a notepad because we're going to cover a lot of material very, very quickly. So it is entitled Hamas Part 5, Hamas in America, and then the... uh, Subtitle of this study tonight, as I said, would simply be this. BDS, Hamas, Christian Palestinianism, and Replacement Theology denies Israel's divine and legal right to the land. Notice I said their divine and legal right. You know, there are those in Israel that are not um, really even believing in the divine right of them to possess the land. They might just simply believe in the legal right. In fact, there are probably many Americans who are in favor of Israel's uh, right to the land from a legal perspective. And in the coming weeks, we will look at some of the uh, historical, historical decisions that have been made on the world stage by a collection of nations going back to the 1920s and the Belfar Declaration and others that legally declared that was the rightful land of Israel. So we're really dealing with two issues, their divine right to the land and their legal right to the land. And we'll get started this week, but we will have to certainly continue next week. Now, before we do, let's set a little understanding, because I will be using as a basis to show that John Piper and the people who believe like him, many of the neo-Calvinists today uh, who uh, buy into replacement theology, like Luther, like Calvin, Uh, Many of them, Luther and Calvin, wrote horrible things about the Jews, and uh, there are many who are Reformed. I want to make sure I add this little caveat. There are many who are Reformed, or would call themselves Calvinists, uh, who are very much uh, dispensationalist and in defense of Israel. I would think of men like uh, Charles Ryrie, uh, Dr. Chafer of Chafer's Theological Seminary that my friend Dr. Andy Woods is the president of. I would think of men like Uh, Dr. Tommy Ice, who I spoke to the other day and who is a broadcaster with us and is uh, teaching through the book of Daniel. In fact, I think if that's not online now, it will be in the next day or so, his first lesson teaching through the book of Daniel. So there is a guy who would call himself Reformed, Dr. Tommy Ice, 
uh, but yet he is a great defender of the nation state of Israel, their legal right and their divine right to the land. So I'm sure there are those of you listening tonight who say, hey, Brandon, don't forget about us reformed guys who <laughs> are not into replacement theology. And I want to give a shout out to you. Sadly, you're the minority and you are probably very aware of the fact that you are greatly criticized by people in the reformed camp. And sadly, those who believe in the legal and divine right of the nation state of Israel and from a dispensational standpoint is a uh, shrinking uh, group of people. But it's very important. And we'll see tonight that one reason these guys get off base is because they don't know how to study the Bible. Uh, John Piper is a perfect example of someone who is a uh, Calvinist, neo-Calvinist, not dispensationalist, and he clearly has no clue how to study the Bible in context on a consistent basis, I believe. I think, I will, I think we'll prove that tonight. In fact, let's jump off with this article from September 2017, because I think this shows that we're dealing with a guy that can't even get the gospel right. Why would we think he get, could get the issues related to Israel right or studying the Bible in context right? Here it is, September 25th, 2017, John Piper at Desiring God, his website, headline, Does God Really Save Us by Faith Alone? Well, let me just say right there, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Isn't Ephesians pretty clear? It is by grace through faith that we have been saved. It is by grace through faith. Now, I believe in faith and repentance, but repentance is not where you go up and clean up your life or get regenerated so you can get saved or get enlightened so you can be saved. Faith and repentance are two sides of a coin. Uh, metanoia, to change one's mind about who you are, what you are, what you deserve. Uh, repentance, to change one's mind that you cannot save yourself, and you, thus you place your faith and trust in God. Believe. Pestiduo, this is a, a word that is used in the book of John over and over for placing one's trust or faith in. Not believing that, but believing in. I believe that George Washington lived that he was a real historical figure, but I don't believe in George Washington, right? So it is a belief or a faith trusting in, placing one's faith and trust in, by which you also, by faith and repentance, repentance being correctly defined as changing your mind. No, I can't save myself. No, I'm not a good person. Yes, I've broken the moral law. And as you understand that you're a sinner, you cry out to God and by faith we're saved. That's it, by faith, not by works. And many today have turned it into a works gospel. It's also called Lordship Salvation. And for many years, I thought I would have agreed with that. But I found out later, hey, they don't mean the same thing I do. Of course, he's my Lord and my Savior. But I came later to find out that many of them pushing the Lordship Salvation doctrine, what they're really teaching is works, works. But the Bible's clear is by grace through faith, right? Well, John Piper doesn't think that. And as you'll see, he has a false gospel. Well, if he can't get the gospel right, if you can't study the Bible in context related to salvation and the gospel, how would he get it right when it comes to the nation state of Israel? Well, the poor guy doesn't. But here's what he said in his article. He said, essential to the Christian life and necessary for final salvation is the killing of sin and the pursuit of holiness. Really? Essential to the Christian life and necessary for final salvation is the killing of sin and the pursuit of holiness. I'm sorry, John. You're confusing justification and sanctification, which is what those in the Lordship Salvation crowd do that define it as they do. They, they are confusing the sanctification process with justification. And so what you have is a works gospel, not a gospel uh, of by grace through faith, but a gospel of salvation by works or justification by works, not justification by faith as the Bible teaches. So here's John Piper saying, hey, for final salvation, you got to go do something. That's not a whole lot different than what the Catholic Church teaches. And of course, the problem with many of these neo-Calvinists is uh, they're really just preaching a Roman Catholicism that's been repackaged, I believe, for the Protestant world. Now, that all to say, if the guy has a false gospel, and I think he does, would we be shocked then, as I said, that he can't get it right when it comes to interpreting the scripture related to Israel, if he can't get the scripture interpreted right related to something like the gospel. Well, here's an example. Do the Jews have a divine right to the promised land? This is from John Piper going back to 2002. And he says, how should Bible-believing Christians align themselves in the Jewish-Palestinian conflict? 
There are biblical reasons for treating both sides with compassionate public justice in the same way that disputes should be settled between nations generally. In other words, the Bible does not teach us to be partial to Israel or partial to pal the Palestinians because either has a special divine status, end quote. Let me just stop you right there, John Piper. Um, that isn't keeping with what we read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is it? I think we can refute what John Piper's teaching by just simply going to the scripture. Here we go. Genesis 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wait a minute. Let's go back to what John said. The Bible does not teach us to be partial to Israel. Wait a minute. It teaches us specifically to defend the Jewish people, to bless them. What is another word for bless? Speak well. We looked it up. We've done a study of that. We go and look up the word bless, to bless someone in a dictionary or maybe a couple different dictionaries. What you'll find is to bless someone is to speak well of them. If someone is trashing on you or your spouse, wouldn't your um, spouse, let's say your spouse, wouldn't, if someone's trashing your spouse, wouldn't your spouse consider it a great blessing that you came to their defense by speaking well of them and refuting the lie? Wouldn't they, wouldn't they figure it a blessing if someone was cursing them, speaking ill of them, and you stepped up and you defended them? Wouldn't your spouse consider that a great blessing to have a spouse that defends them and speaks well of them when others don't and sets the record straight? Sure. Who wouldn't? It wouldn't even have to be your spouse. How about just a friend or a neighbor or a coworker? Well, that's what it means in part to bless Israel, to speak well of her, to defend her. When others malign or slander her and speak all evil against her and lie, we come to her defense and we speak truth. And by doing that, we are blessing Israel. And in return, we will receive a blessing. Now, I don't know of any passage in the Bible that says that we are to go out there and defend any other people group. And if we do that, it comes with a special blessing. Or if we don't, it can come with a curse. And if we're involved in cursing the Jews, it in itself can come with a curse or a curse and curse in kind. And yet through the scripture, we see that a curse and curse in kind as Dr. Dr. Arnold Frutenbaum so well laid out in our uh, Ozarks 2019 Worldview Weekend, a curse and curse in kind. And so I would say John Piper is wrong to say the Bible does not teach us to be partial to Israel or to the Palestinians because either has a special divine status. Indeed, the Jewish people do have a divine status. They have a divine status. I'm a Gentile, but I recognize the Jewish people have a divine status given to them by God. God used that people, those people, uh, to bring us uh, the line of David uh, from which would come our Savior, Messiah, Yeshua. He used the Jewish writers as the Holy Spirit moved upon them to give us the word of God. They are indeed a special people, a particular and special people and we are to bless them and to guard them and protect them and speak well of them and not curse them. Now, that doesn't mean we agree with everything that every Jewish person ever does. No. That also doesn't mean we agree with everything that the Israeli government ever does. No. But we understand in God's big picture economy what his plan has been and will be for the Jewish people. And we agree with that plan. And in tonight's broadcast and next week, we'll see in part what that plan has been and will be. And so John Piper is wrong right off the bat in his article. Now, why is this connected to BDS or Hamas? Why am I making that connection? Because BDS, which is Boycott Divestment Sanctions, says that the Jews don't have a divine right to the land, that the Jews are occupiers, they're colonizers, they're an apartheid state, they're racist, they're uh, oppressors, they've been involved in genocide, all kinds of lies, all kinds of cursing lies. You, know, you can curse someone without using a swear word at them. You can curse someone by speaking lies about them. That is not a blessing, that's a curse. And yet these are the curses spoken about the Jewish people. And we will, in this series, as we already have, but we will continue to bring up specific lies about the Jewish people and refute those. Now, again, don't confuse the Jewish people with the state of Israel. At times, we don't agree with the state of Israel does. We don't agree at times with what some of the Jewish people are doing. But we understand what God is doing long term. And yes, we understand that there are Jews that have come to salvation in Yeshua, Messiah. There are Jews that have yet to do that. And so, yes, they're not saved. And they act just as you and I did before we were saved and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they regularly practice sin, right? 
but we know what God is going to do with them. And we understand that and we can, div we can differentiate between certain individual Jewish people and their actions or the is state of Israel and the government of Israel and the Jewish people as a whole and what God's plan will be for them as we enter into the last days and the tribulation period and then roll into the millennial kingdom. And we understand that and we can differentiate between those different groups of people when we talk about the Jewish people, right? Just as we can about Gentiles. So the connection here is BDS, Hamas, these groups are spewing hatred about the Jewish people. They are spewing curses. They're spewing lies. They're saying they don't have a right to the land. They don't have a divine right to the land. They have no legal right to the land. Well, John Piper is saying basically the same thing. They have no spiritual right to the land. They have no legal right to the land. Tell me how that is not aiding the BDS movement. How, how is that not aiding, aiding Christian Palestinianism? The opposite of being a Christian Zionist is to be a, quote, Christian Palestinian or into Christian Palestinianism, right? Well, again, if you're pushing Christian Palestinianism or you're a pastor or a Christian saying they have no legal or spiritual right to the land, you're really regurgitating the same things that BDS and Hamas and Muslim Brotherhood and CARE and these groups are doing. And you see how this is very dangerous? And I also think it sets up a false dominant church that is coming. A false dominant church that's coming that will be involved in the persecution of the Jewish people once again. Just as the false church in Germany was, the German Christians as they were called, who dissolved their denominations and united under the Reich Bishop, handpicked by Adolf Hitler. And they mixed the swastika with the cross. And many, many Jews today are very, very skeptical, skeptical of Christians. Many of them are afraid of Christians. They don't like Christians because so many things have been done in the name of Christianity. And so things like Christianity, the cross, these things are uh, red flags for many Jewish people. And so we have to understand where they're coming from and be sensitive on how we speak to them and talk to them and make sure they understand who we are as a Christian Zionist. And yet... Just as the Jews were persecuted by a false church, so a false church in the future will persecute the Jews. Remember, as I said, the, the false church in Germany, the German Christians, dissolved their denominations and united under the Reich Bishop handpicked by Adolf Hitler. Many of them were of Reformed Calvinist denominations. Why? Because many of them had been taught the wrong thing about Israel from guys like Luther and Calvin. And it really continues today, and it, what happened during the Holocaust, unfortunately, will be repeated. And largely, there will be so-called Christians helping lead the way in the anti-Semitism with replacement theology, saying things like the Jews don't have a spiritual or legal right to the land, which in really many regards is very common to what BDS is all about, what Hamas is all about. So that's our connection tonight. John Piper is not helping the Jewish people. He's not helping the cause of Christ. I don't believe he's obeying the scriptures to bless the Jews. I believe actually whether he means to or not, intends to or not, and he probably doesn't, whether he knows it or not, I believe in many regards he is aiding the advancement of the philosophies and ideas that are propagated by the proponents, the activists of BDS, and those who buy into um, anti-Semitism. Now, Piper goes on to say, nor do I deny that God promised to Israel the presently disputed land from the time of Abraham onward. God said to Moses, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to your offspring, end quote. Now that's very interesting because he says, I don't deny that God promised to Israel the presently disputed land. Okay, so what he's going to dispute is that that promise is still being kept today. So apparently, John Piper believes that God is a covenant breaker, not a covenant keeper. I don't know how John Piper sleeps at night because that means if God can break his promise to Israel, he can break his promise to John Piper on salvation. So I don't know how well John Piper sleeps at night, but I would have a hard time sleeping thinking that God could break his promise and that indeed I could be plucked out of his hand, that he would leave me and forsake me. But then again, we've already seen that John Piper doesn't believe in a gospel by grace. He believes or a gospel by grace through faith, he believes in one by works. You have to have final salvation by slaying sin and pursuing holiness. So we already know he must not sleep too well at night uh, if he's based on a works gospel. How could you sleep well at night? But again, the point is this. If God breaks his promises to Israel, what makes you think he's going to keep his promise to you and to me? Well, God is not a 
covenant breaker. He is a covenant keeper, and he will keep his promise to Israel despite what John Piper might believe. He goes on to say, but neither of these biblical facts leads necessarily to the endorsement of present-day Israel as the rightful possessor of all disputed land. Israel may have such a right, and she may not. But that decision is not based on divine privilege. Why? All right, what he's saying is, okay, so she may have some legal right, but she certainly doesn't have any divine right, no divine privileges. But he's even disputing whether she has any legal right. But he doesn't make any mistake when declaring he believes that they don't have a divine right. He goes on to say, first, a non-covenant keeping people does not have a divine right to hold the land of promise. Both the blessed status of the people and the privileged right to the land are conditional on Israel's keeping the covenant God made with her. Thus God said to Israel, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. Israel has no warrant to a present experience of divine privilege when she is not keeping covenant with God. All right, well, here's the problem. What he's confusing is their disobedience, God's judgment, and yet God's fulfilling his future promise to them. Sure, the Jews disobeyed over and over, and God warned them, if you do this and disobey me, this will happen. And if you don't repent and you continue to disobey me, the punishment will get harder and harder and harder, and I will disperse you throughout all the land. I will scatter you, and I will discipline you. But then, praise God, he says, I will then bring you back. All, all through the scriptures, we see promises that God will bring them back. He will regather them to the land, physically regathering them, and then he will spiritually renew them. He will physically regather them, and then he will spiritually renew them. And the Bible is clear about that. Uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37 speak to this issue and the, the dry bones and the bones coming together. And now we see the Jewish people scattered throughout the world coming back together. They're being assembled again, bones being reassembled. But eventually we see in Ezekiel 36 and 37, not only do you have the assembly of the bones coming together, but then you have the filling with breath or with life. And one day those Jewish people as they have gathered back in their nation state of Israel, became a nation in May of 1948. They're being regathered together as the bones of a skeleton. Eventually, through a tribulation and judgment, God brings them to repentance and they turn to him and they cry out to him and then they are filled with breath. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They are the people that will go forth and preach the gospel in such huge numbers. A great revival breaks out. And the Bible says that so many are becoming believers in Yeshua, our Messiah, that it is almost impossible to number them. You see, sadly, John Piper apparently doesn't study the full Bible, or if he does, he can't study it, study it in context because he doesn't use the proper rules for studying the Bible. We already know that he takes scripture and he rips it out of context and he misapplies it. And he can't seem to figure out justification for sanctification. So he clearly doesn't understand set rules or hermeneutics for studying the Bible. And this is very common with the neo-Calvinist. They are very quick to spiritualize things, to make things up, to rip scripture out of context. So again, when he says that they have disobeyed God, that they've, uh, the, the land is uh, a privileged right, and it's conditional on Israel keeping the covenant God made with her. And he throws out Exodus 19.5 as he'll throw out a lot of scripture. Uh, just because they have disobeyed God doesn't mean that God has broken his word. Just because they have broken fellowship doesn't mean God has broken his word. He goes on to say, Psalm 78, 54 uh, through 61, Israel has no divine right to be in the land of promise when she's breaking the covenant of promise. Again, these passages he's giving have nothing to do with that. They have nothing to do with saying uh, God has re broken his promise. God has rescinded his promise. He is not, he is not going to keep his covenant with you, Israel. <laughs> the, the verses he's citing don't say that. The verses he's citing simply deal with God punishing them when they don't obey. Now, when you see the verses there and what he's saying, you assume, oh, well, those passages must say God's going to not fulfill his promise to the Jewish people, that he's rescinded his offer, he's not going to keep the covenant. No, that's not what they're saying at all. If you go look up those verses, as we'll do in a minute, or next week, depending on how far we go, you will see all they're doing, all these verses are doing, is describing God's judgment on them. 
and then scattering them. But again, he seems to have forgotten the passage that talk about regathering them once again into their nation, the nation of Israel. He goes on, secondly, Israel as a whole today rejects her Messiah, Jesus Christ, God's son. This is the ultimate act of covenant breaking with God. God promised that to Israel a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, wait a minute. Look at what he's doing here. God promised that to Israel a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Wait a minute. He's acknowledging that God has promised that to them. If God has promised that to them, and even John, John Piper acknowledges that, how could he then say that God's not going to keep his promise? Because he just said, God promised to Israel a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, when will that be? That will be during the millennial reign. During the millennial reign, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be the head of this government, ruling and reigning there during the millennial kingdom from Jerusalem. So isn't it ironic? He's saying, well, God's not going to keep his promise, but the, hey, wait a minute, God has promised to the Israeli people, to the Jews, to Israel, a government that shall be upon his shoulders. Well, which one is it, Piper? He goes on to say, when the builders rejected the beautiful cornerstone, Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Matthew 21, 43. He explained, quote, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, end quote. Well, when you read that, you're thinking, oh, wow, the Jews are going to be thrown into outer darkness. Uh, the kingdom's going to be given to someone else. Mm, I wonder who might that be. Well, if you buy into replacement theology, uh, the offer of the kingdom rejected by the Jews, true, and then God turned around through Christ and offered the kingdom to the church. And so we have replacement theology. There you go. The promises to Israel were now given to the church. The church now replaces Israel, or it's also sometimes referred to as spiritual Israel. The church is now spiritual Israel. And all the promises that were, were um, offered, all the great blessings that were offered, the kingdom that was offered to the Jewish people, which they rejected, and they did, it wasn't just put on hold or delayed. It was completely denied to them forever, and it has instead been given to the church, and so the church has now replaced Israel. That's called replacement theology, taught by anti-Semites like Luther and Calvin. So, what is the real meaning of this text? Matthew 21, 43, in context, refutes replacement theology and kingdom now theology. It doesn't teach it. In fact, it refutes it. Now, remember, here's what he said. When the, when the builders rejected the beautiful cornerstone, Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you meaning the Jews, and given to a people producing its fruits. All right, so what does this mean? Well, let's go look at the full text, because one of the things we know when it comes to studying the Bible is what? Context, context, context. Read the verses before, read the verses after, have a context. Isn't it interesting that John Piper doesn't go on and read the other following verses? Because if you do, you have the context, and you realize that John Piper is wrong. Here, let's go back to verse 43 of Matthew 21. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Verse 45. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Well, John Piper may not know the context, but the people Jesus was speaking to, they clearly knew the context, and the context was them, that generation of Israel, that generation of the Jews. That's who he's speaking about. He wasn't saying to all the Jews ever to come from now into eternity, I am done with you. No, he was speaking directly to them. In fact, look what I highlighted. Therefore, I say to you, who? The people he's speaking to, the chief priests and Pharisees. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation. Wait a minute. What, wouldn't that be the proper time for, for Jesus to say it will be given to the church? It will be given to ecclesia. It will be given to Gentile believers. 
He says it will be given to a nation, bearing the fruits of it. What nation? The future nation of Israel, who will be bearing fruits. And one way they'll be bearing fruits is by having come to salvation in Christ. The bones regathering. They're regathering from all over the world, those bones. And then they're filled with life, with breath, with the Holy Spirit, with salvation. And then they begin to preach the gospel. And boy, is there fruit. People becoming saved in such incredible numbers. The Bible says it's almost impossible to number them. Wow, what incredible fruit of that nation state of Israel is yet to come. But wait a minute. The nation. Is the church a nation? Is the, is the church ever described as a nation? Again, I got dyslexia. If I can read this stuff and figure it out, pray tell why can't people like John Piper? Well, let's continue looking. And let's go to an article by a good friend of mine, Dr. Andy Woods. He's one of our broadcasters. He's written an article. By the way, he has a whole book. But here's an article that comes from that book. Kingdom taken from Israel and given to the church? Question mark. Here's what he writes. Yet another statement by Christ used by kingdom now, but let me just stop by right now and say, what, what does that mean? We got people who are involved in replacement theology. I've already explained that. The promises that were given to Israel have been canceled, and now Israel has been replaced by the church, i.e. replacement theology. And they use this text in Matthew 21. Kingdom now people also use it and say that the kingdom of God is right here, right now. The Jews rejected the kingdom. He turned around and offered it now instead to the church, and now the kingdom of God is in full operation right now. No, it's not. Is, is Jesus ruling and reigning from Israel tonight? No. Has Satan been bound? No. Has sin been eradicated from the earth? In other words, has sin, has sin been bound or has evil been bound while he rules and reigns from Jerusalem? No. Huh. Has the uh, creation been restored per Romans chapter 8? Creation been restored? Hmm. No, not last I checked. But yet they believe that somehow Matthew 21, 43 tells them the kingdom is now in operation. So it's not only used for replacement theology, it's used for kingdom now theology. Well, Andy Woods goes on to refute this in his excellent article. Yet another statement by Christ used by kingdom now theologians is found in Matthew 21, 43, which says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. Debate persists concerning from whom the kingdom is taken and to whom it is given. Kingdom now theologians argue that Christ in verse 43 is teaching that the kingdom will be permanently, permanently taken away from Israel and instead given in spiritual form to the church. However, for two primary reasons, this theology of replacement is not supported by this passage. First, the replacement theologian's error is asserting the kingdom was to be taken away from Israel as a whole. The context indicates that Christ was only speaking to first century Israel. Matthew 21, 45 says, quote, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them, end quote. The first century group of unbelieving Israel and her religious leader is the exclusive group that the kingdom was to be taken away from rather than Israel as a whole at all times and places. Second, the replacement theologian errs in asserting that the church is the nation that is to receive the kingdom. The nation in question cannot be the church since the church is not a nation. In Romans 10, 19, Paul writes, quote, But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses, I will make you a jealous, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you, end quote. Here, Paul explains how God's present blessing on the church is currently provoking unbelieving Israel to jealousy. In this description, Paul calls the church a non nation. The singular noun nation, ethnos, is twice used here to, to, to depict the church's lack of national status. After all, the church does not consist of a single nation, but rather consists of believers in Jesus Christ from all nations. Some use 1 Peter 2, 9 to support the idea that the church is a nation. However, this argument is incorrectly, it incorrectly assumes that 1 Peter was written 
First Peter was written to the church at large rather than merely to the believing Jews in the diaspora. So again, the evidence is overwhelming here, folks. The nation is not referring to the church, thereby we're not in a kingdom that's been offered to us now, and the promises to Israel have not been transferred to the church, thus replacing Israel. Now we've just shot down kingdom now theology and replacement theology, which by the way, is dominating every denomination in America. You know what's so shocking is the false teaching the twisted scripture, the bad hermeneutics, the isogesis of the neo-Calvinists has penetrated many non-reformed, non-Calvinist churches. And that's how you end up with a false church. That's how you end up with a global false church that eventually becomes the Revelation 17, 1 harlot that sits on many waters that eventually helps to usher in the woman that rides the beast, Babylon, the kingdom of Antichrist, a false church. And isn't it interesting that this false teaching now is permeating through people like John Piper and others, the gospel coalition that he's a part of, that's not only pushing uh, the wrong view on Israel, but they're pushing social justice, reparations, white privilege, ecumenicalism, interfaith dialogue, all kinds of trash. The Gospel Coalition has permeated so many non-reformed, non-Calvinist churches that it's shocking. And this, my friends, is how you end up with a false church per Revelation 17, 1, that helps to usher in the kingdom of Antichrist. And we know eventually what the kingdom of Antichrist will do, and it will turn and it will slaughter the Jews. And there will be another Holocaust, which is why I have the documentary coming out, Holocaust horizon. Dr. Woods continues writing, rather than seeing the nation as the church, it seems far better to conclude that the nation spoken of in Matthew 21, 43 is a future generation of believing Jews. This view fits well with the remaining context of Matthew's gospel, which speaks of a physical and spiritual future restoration of national Israel. Furthermore, the word nation, ethnos, is translated people or nation in Matthew 21, 43 is used of national Israel elsewhere in scripture, such as in John eleven fifty one 51, Acts 24, 17. Thus, contrary to the kingdom now rendering of Matthew 21, 43, that the kingdom will be taken from Israel as a whole and instead given in a spiritual form to the church, the verse when taken in context actually teaches that the kingdom will be taken away from first century Israel only and instead given to future believing national Israel in the coming tribulation period, a millennial kingdom." End quote. Amen. And my friend, that is why, my friends, that is why we have gone to great expense to fly in men like Dr. Andy Woods, pay for their airfare, put them up in a hotel, have them at this news desk, have them teach, spend hours post-editing, spend the, the time and money and energy and the resources to post edit his show and put it out there because he is one of the few, and I mean few, Bible teachers in America that actually can teach the Bible in context. And in fact, he came to me through the recommendation of a reformed Calvinist dispensationalist, my friend, Dr. Tommy Ice. And that's another reason why we bring Dr. Ice in. And we'll be launching this week his series on Daniel. We finished up his series on Revelation because he is one of our Reformed brothers who gets it right. And we want to highlight him. Other than that, we've cut out a lot of the Reformed people, if you haven't noticed. We've cut them off our site. We've gotten rid of them because they are so sloppy in their hermeneutics. They are not dispensationalist. They have defended those of their crowd, their neo-Calvinist camp, their extreme works-centered gospel camp. They have defended those in their camp who've been involved in interfaith dialogue. So there's a lot of reasons to clean out our broadcast network and move away from these reformed neo-Calvinist, hyper-Calvinist types. But we want to highlight the reformed guys like Dr. Tommy Ice, who are reformed dispensationalists, because there are some of you in our listening audience that are reformed dispensationalists, and you appreciate a guy like Dr. Tommy Ice, as do I. So you see the balance that we're having here as we bring in men like Dr. Andy Woods, Dr. Tommy Ice, 
and we let them teach because we understand they know how to study the Word of God in context, and we just saw that from Dr. Andy Woods. And you can see that if you want to get his whole book on kingdom theology. He did his whole PhD on this, a whole book on it. I'm sure you'll find it at andywoodsministries.org. Let's go over to Matthew, Matthew 23, verses 37 to 39, because this is interesting. Jesus is lamenting over Israel. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, I'm not going to go into it tonight, but we could say a lot right now about hyper-Calvinism. They weren't willing. They had a choice to make, and they weren't willing. They had a choice to make, and they were not willing. Kind of blows away the hyper-Calvinism, does it not? See, verse 38, see, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All right, Jesus is going to stop speaking and, 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 and teaching publicly, and there's the ascension, and he's not coming back to teach or speak like this to them until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, why on earth would the Jews be saying to the one that their people crucified, along with the, the Gentiles and the Romans, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Because they have gone from unbelief to belief. They have been scattered in judgment by God, as God promised. They now have been shown grace and mercy, are assembled once again, and are being assembled per Ezekiel 36, 37. The bones are coming together, and eventually they will be filled with the breath of life, the Holy Spirit, and they then will be in belief. Not in unbelief, in belief. And they will be great worldwide evangelists, and they will declare, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I guess this is not in the Bible of John Piper. I guess John Piper isn't aware, as are others that teach like he does, that there are many Gentiles today that are in unbelief. There are many sinful Gentiles that are blaspheming God. They're rejecting God. They're criticizing God. Some of them now are, are strident in their opposition to God. But like maybe some of you, they will come to faith and repentance, and they will become some of the greatest evangelists the world has known. I have friends of mine that are former atheists, former Muslims. They hated Christians. They hated Christ. Today, through faith and repentance, they are some of the greatest evangelists you'll ever find. That goes on in the Gentile world. Can that not go on with the Jews? It will. Does John Piper not understand that unbelieving people do what unbelieving people do? But the unbelieving, disobedient one who's a Gentile, isn't stopped from coming to Christ and having the promises fulfilled to them as a Gentile, why should that be the case with the Jews? Because if it is, God is a covenant breaker, not a covenant keeper. Piper writes, the Christian plea in the Middle East to Palestinians and Jews is, believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And until that great day, when both Jewish and Gentile followers of King Jesus inherit the earth, not just the land, without lifting sword or gun, the rights of nations should be decided by the principles of compassionate and public justice, not claims to the national divine right or status, end quote. Well, again, that's just a stupid comment. Because you could say that about America. If America is invaded, should we decide who's right based on principles of compassionate and public justice if we're just invaded by another nation? Or should we, should we claim some kind of legal right to the land? Yeah, we can claim a legal right. You're, you're breaking our sovereignty. You've invaded us. We're going to war. If someone comes into your house, do you not have the legal right to defend your home? Yes. The Jewish people have a legal right, but they have something more than just a legal right. They have a divine right for the promises of God. And John Piper here is making light of not only their legal right to actually defend their rights as a nation with the sword or the gun, but they have a divine right as well. Would John Piper not defend his own legal right of his property? No, we know the answer to that because he's already said Christians should not own a gun. 
that if someone were to break into his house, he doesn't know what he'd do. He might hit, throw the gun at him or hit him over the head, but he's not going to shoot him because they might die and go to hell. Well, again, this guy can't make his theology work in the real world because if someone breaks into his house and he has to defend his own life or that of his family and he shoots and kills the guy and he goes to hell, then guess what, John Piper? That guy wasn't one of the elect. John Piper can't make his own theology apparently work in the real world related to his own life and private property. Much less can he with the Jewish people in their life and private property, which is not just a legal right, it is a divine spiritual right, as we shall see. So, here's the question. Has the kingdom of God been transferred from physical Jerusalem to spiritually within believers? Let me ask that question again. Has the kingdom of God been transferred from physical Jerusalem to spiritually within believers? Well, here's what John Piper teaches. February 4th, 1990, on his website, Desiring God, is the kingdom present or future? He says, is the kingdom of God a future reality to be hoped for or a present reality to experience now? That's today's question. The answer is that it is partly present and partly future. Many of its blessings are here to be enjoyed now, but many of them are not yet here. Some of its power is available now, but not all of it. Some of the curse and misery of this old age can be overcome now by the presence of the kingdom, but some of it cannot be. The kingdom of God is present. This is another part of his article. So basically what he's teaching here is already here, not yet, or partly here. I mean, this is, this is very confusing, and the, and the scriptures are not that confusing about this topic. Now, many people have made the kingdom of God very confusing, and it can be very confusing, but if you study it correctly, in context, it doesn't have to be confusing. And again, that's why Dr. Andy Woods did his PhD on this, and he's got a big, thick book on the kingdom. And if you get it and read it, you'll, or, or watch any of his teaching on this, you'll quickly find what is largely very confusing for most people isn't that complex at all if you just study it in context. So Piper is making it very confusing because he's not even teaching what's true. Okay, now under this section, the kingdom of God is present. He says, our text, Luke 17, 20 to 21, is a clear statement that Christ's own coming is the kingdom, is the coming of the kingdom. Really? It's that clear, is it? And he quotes Luke 17, 20 to 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, lo, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. End quote. All right, so John Piper takes this text and says, there you go, folks. Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's, it's right here, right now. No. He says the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Who? Those Jewish people he's speaking to. He was the king. Here he's offering the kingdom. The king and the kingdom go together. You don't separate the king and the kingdom. If the king is there, his kingdom is being represented, and the kingdom and his authority is here and now, and he's offering it to them. They did reject him, but he was offering it to them. He said, it's in your midst. It's right. What's he say? For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's not in the midst of us right now, but he says it was in the midst of them right then because he was there. You see? Now, let's go on. He says another clear statement about the presence of the kingdom is Matthew 12, 28. The Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub or Satan. But Jesus has a very different interpretation of what's happening. He says in verse 28, quote, if it is by the power of the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, end quote. When Jesus does battle with Satan, by the Spirit of God, and begins to plunder the strong man's house, freeing people from his bondage, the powers of the kingdom are at work, and the kingdom is already present, end quote. No, it's not. When Jesus said to them in verse 28, the, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, what he's again simply saying is, here it is, it's been offered. If I'm casting out demons by the power of the Spirit of God, then that should only reveal to you who I am. I am God incarnate. And I am offering you the kingdom. And I have the power to offer you the kingdom. And I can do miracles and signs and wonders. And casting out demons was one of the ways he showed that he could do the supernatural, that he was a supernatural God. 
God incarnate. And he's showing the powers of the age to come as well. But again, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Who is he speaking to? Those Jews right then, right there, the ones that are going to eventually crucify him along with the Romans. Now, just because it's being described as being among them or coming to them or being in their midst to them doesn't mean that's for us today. What's described is not necessarily being prescribed as what's happening to us today. That's why context. Who wrote it? When did they write it? Who did they write it to? Who's he speaking to? What's the context? You don't spiritually allegorize this and now say, oh, well, that applies to us. So obviously now the kingdom of God is here. No, he was saying it was there among them right then in the midst. He was there. He's the king. He's making an offer. They rejected him. It's put on hold. Now he wants to go on and say that when Jesus Christ saves somebody because he defeated Satan on the cross, that somehow that's the powers of the kingdom working already. No, it's not. When someone gets saved today through the power of the Holy Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel because Christ defeated Satan on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection, and someone today becomes saved, that doesn't have anything to do with the work of the kingdom here and now. But John Piper says it does, apparently. Go over to Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Again, the devil took him, speaking of Jesus, up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me, end quote. Now, as I was doing my study for this, I, I thought of this passage. I thought to myself, wait a minute. If the kingdom was already in play, because that's what Piper's teaching, G Jesus is there among them, he's doing miracles, and because he's in front of them and he's there and he's offered the kingdom, because Jesus came, now the kingdom came. That's what we, we've already read, that's what John Piper taught. Because Jesus came, the kingdom came with him, and the kingdom's here now. Well, if that's the case, and Jesus is over the kingdom, he owns the kingdom, he has the kingdom, he's established the kingdom, why on earth do we see in Matthew 4, it says that Satan is offering him all the kingdoms. And who's going to give them to him? Satan will. He says, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. Wouldn't Jesus just turn and say, sorry, buddy, I already own all this. It's my kingdom. Did you not hear? I came, I established my kingdom. It's all mine. Why would I need to worship you for you to give me all the kingdoms of the world? I already established my kingdom. Oh, and by the way, I'm sending you off to eternity to be bound. No, that's not what happened, right? Because why? Because he didn't establish his kingdom. Right now, the God of this world is Satan. That's why he could make this offer. He's on a leash. He's given power for a period of time. But eventually, God will establish his, his kingdom at the second coming. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who's the God of this age? Satan. So wait a minute. Jesus is the king of this world while Satan is the God of this world? Is that what we're to believe? Well, that's what you have to believe if you follow the teaching of men like John Piper. Jesus is the king of this world while Satan is also the God of this world. Wow. Well, you see, the kingdom is not in play right now. Piper goes on to say, and finally, the encouragement. The kingdom really has arrived. Unprecedented fulfillments of God's purposes are in the offing. Wait a minute. The kingdom of God doesn't come in stages or in waves. Unprecedented fulfillments of God's purposes are in the offing. Well, it's coming, folks. It's coming. There's little offings coming all the time. The kingdom's becoming more and more and more and more visible. We've got to make the invisible kingdom visible. And this is, by the way, what has been taught at John Piper's church. I have the audio, I have the video, I have the transcripts of this kind of talk at John Piper's church in his pulpit a few years ago when he was still the pastor at Bethlehem Baptist. We've got to make the invisible kingdom visible. And how do we do that? Well, we start bringing down crime and, and rape and robbery. And, and as Christians go out there and, and take dominion, the invisible kingdom becomes visible. And all these things begin to happen and we establish the kingdom of God. No, Jesus said in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. It is not from here. If it were, my disciples would fight to keep me from being turned over to the Jews. We don't see the kingdom of God coming in waves or phases or as we take more and more dominion. We don't see that as we promote social justice or cultural Marxism. 
their kingdom coming into being. That's how they're going to bring about the kingdom of Antichrist, through ecumenicalism, social justice, uh, playing patty cake with the Islamist, you know, all, all of this trash they're doing. That's how you bring in a kingdom, all right. But it's not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of Antichrist. And yes, a false church will help do it. Revelation 17, 1. And then John was carried away with another vision where he sees now a woman riding a beast. Now we have another harlot. That is the kingdom of Antichrist based in Babylon. But what helped bring it about? The woman that sits on many waters, which is what? A false church, Revelation 17, 1. So these guys want to do this? Think they're building the kingdom of God? Sorry, you're, whether you know it or not, building the kingdom of Antichrist. Because Daniel 2 says God brings his kingdom. There we go. In no, no special offing in stages or the invisible kingdom becoming more and more visible as they do their social justice trash and all the other trash they're doing over there at the Gospel Coalition. But look, he says, the king has come. Really? Where? Wait a minute. Did you read that in the newspaper today, what, what Jesus said from the throne in, in Jerusalem? No, because the king hasn't come. The king has dealt with sin once and for all in the sacrifice of himself. Yeah, but not for the world. Sin is still very prevalent here, right? Right? Well, that's not going to be the case in the kingdom. Evil will be bound. The king sits at the right, father's right hand and reigns now until all his enemies are under his feet. Really, is that, is that what's going on now? Is, are, the, are, the king, are the enemies of Christ under his feet? Has Satan been bound? No. John Piper is so wrong. The king's righteousness is now already ours by faith. The king's spirit is now already dwelling in us. The king's holiness is now already being produced in us. The king's joy and peace have now already been given to us. The king's victory over Satan is now already ours as we use the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Really, again, these things are true about us, but not about the earth. Again, he's comparing apples and oranges. He, he is not correctly describing what's going on. This is not the kingdom. It's not in play. He's not here. He's not ruling. Sin has not been bound. The earth has not been renewed. That is yet to come. And by the way, what we're proving here is we are not now in the kingdom of God, but we will eventually be in the kingdom of God. But what is necessary for the kingdom of God to come? What's necessary is for the Jews to be restored to the land physically and then to be restored spiritually, which John Piper doesn't even believe will happen. And so next week, we'll pick it up right here as we continue this very special series, Hamas in America, and particularly looking at how the BDS movement, Hamas, Christian Palestinianism, and replacement theology really in many regards go together and are attacking Israel, and they're not blessing Israel. In many regards, they're cursing Israel. And sadly, many in the evangelical world, the, the uh, Christian Palestinianism movement, the Chris, the replacement theology movement, the neo-Calvinist world, they're cursing the Jewish people. They're not speaking well of them. Now, if you appreciate this program, do you know how many hours it takes to prepare for a class like this? Hours and hours and hours. And how do I have time to do that? I mean, I, I, I should be out running another company and providing for my family, but no, I'm studying. And how is it that I'm able to do that? Well, in part, it's because people like you partner with us that provide not only for our streaming ability and our cost and our production, but the ability for us to take the time to study and spend the time studying so we can then present this to you tonight. And so we have a lot of expenses in doing what we do, and we need your support. And you can make a tax-deductible contribution at wvwfoundation.com, wvwfoundation.com. Another way you can support us is by coming, becoming a member of our VIP club. We're going to make this program available to everybody later this week because it's so important. But eventually, we'll roll into our VIP club where we have over a thousand TV shows like this. And you can join for as little as $9.99 at situationroom.net, situationroom.net. Very important program tonight. I hope you'll join us for the uh, continuation of this series next Sunday night, 8 p.m. Central Time, Hamas in America. And we'll particularly continue on this theme, how the BDS movement, Hamas, Christian Palestinianism, and replacement theology really in many ways, are supporting each other in their ideologies against the, the nation state of Israel. Well, till then, I'm Brandon House. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.